Buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por la presencia. Es un verdadero placer para mí presentar al speaker de hoy, al doctor Mariano García Blanco, un reconocido científico puertorriqueño y gran amigo y que ayuda mucho a la Universidad de Puerto Rico. Así que tenemos el placer de que ha dedicado unos días de su ocupada vida a compartir con nosotros y participar en varias actividades académicas. Voy a empezar. El currículum vita de Mariano es impresionante y es imposible resumirlo en unos breves minutos. Pero voy a comenzar desde el principio para recordar que él hizo su high school aquí en San Ignacio. Y tiene la mafia de San Ignacio. <risa> Luego obtuvo su bachillerato en Harvard y obtuvo un MD, PhD en la Universidad de Yale. Es de las po pocas personas que durante sus estudios se tomó dos años, escribió una propuesta, la obtuvo siendo estudiante y se fue a Rockefeller a hacer investigación, a trabajar con interferón en virus, si mal no recuerdo, y publicó su trabajo en un reconocido eh, journal, a tan temprano en su carrera. Y antes de eso empezó su carrera científica con George Hillier, aquí presente, siendo estudiante de high school y publicó un trabajo con George. Y de ahí es que nos conocemos, hace nada más que dos o tres años, no hace mucho tiempo. <risa> eh, Mariano fue un fellow en, el, en MIT del 87 a 90. Y luego se unió a la Universidad de Duke en, en el 90 como assistant professor y es hoy en día profesor de Molecular Genetics and Microbiology y profesor of Medicine. Mariano tiene un sinnúmero de publicaciones en conocidas revistas y ha recibido honores a lo largo de su carrera. Y él se encuentra en Estados Unidos, pero su corazón está aquí también y participa en, anualmente en actividades de estudiantes graduados, seminarios, workshop. Y tenemos el placer de tenerlos hoy con nosotros y nos va a hablar de Physical and Functional Connection Between RNA Polymerase II and the Premessager RNA Splicing Machinery. Con ustedes el doctor García Blanco. Gracias, Adelfa, y gracias a todos por venir. Eh, lo primero que tengo que decir es que si mis maestros de español en San Ignacio me oyeran hoy, les daría vergüenza y me, me negarían el diploma de... Lo único que yo hacía en, en high school es nunca ponía acento, pero ahora ni, ni eso es lo de menos. Así es que con esa, con esa introducción en español voy a, ahora a cambiar a lo que se ha convertido, que mi abuela no se entere, por favor, eh, eh, la lengua científica mía en inglés. Pero, so, yes, uh, Thank you. I, I actually started doing science here, and I, I, I was going to mention this at the end, and I will again, because that was working with George was the beginning, and I, I'm incredibly indebted to George for what has been tremendous fun, uh, and not only for the first research I ever did, and you know how it is, the first time you do something, and if it's successful, it makes a huge difference. And it was uh, successful, it was fun. And also then led me to meet a lot of people. George introduced me to many scientists, Adelfa is one of them. And I'm very happy to have this continual connection. I'm trying to formalize this connection. George and I tried, Adelfa and I have tried. Institutions move like snails, drug snails. And it's not easy <laughs> to, get, to get these things to happen, but we're trying very hard to formalize uh, connections with between Duke and, and the University of Puerto Rico. And we, we'll get there. So now I like to do experiments. Actually, that's a lie. I, I, I like to look at experiments. I don't do them anymore with my own hands. I actually do enjoy doing experiments. But I'm doing an experiment today in that I told Adelfa that this is a topic that I haven't spoken about before. This is a new talk. So you guys are the guinea pigs. And please be honest at the end. Uh, I know it's going to need some workings, but this is, uh, you're going to see some of this data. Some of this data has been published. Some of these data have not been published, and most of them have not been published. And, and this is the first time I put it together in a conference. Um, and um, 
I will allude to the, the bulk of the talk as a tale of two students, because it really, uh, the bulk of the important discoveries are the tale of what two graduate students have done, uh, based on some postdoc work, et cetera. But um, um, remind me to highlight their importance at the end. So uh, we're going to talk about physical and functional connections between RNA polymerase II, the enzyme that makes all of the protein uh, coding transcripts in our cells, and the, uh, and the machinery that actually makes those transcripts that are mostly goobly -go -gar garbled into actual messenger RNAs. And these machineries um, um, talk to each other, connect each other. If you don't remember anything at all from the end of the talk, I think what you must remember, which we're trying to remind ourselves constantly, is that the diagrams in the textbooks are wrong. The diagrams that show DNA and the primary transcript for our genes, which are very complex entities, very large. And then you, you change that into a mature messenger RNA, and then it sort of leaves the nucleus, and then it gets translated in the cytoplasm. Those diagrams are important, but they're wrong. They, they, those steps are all interconnected. They're all actually happening. Many of them, maybe even translation, they're all happening at the same time. But specifically, the first two, transcription and the processing of those RNAs is happening at the same time. So if you want to go to sleep now, you, that's, <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, neither my lab nor the field knows a lot more about this than that. This is a field where there are more reviews than research papers, so you can tell what the level of maturity is, okay? All right, with that, uh, I just want to give a, a slight introduction to the lab and the different projects that we have ongoing in the lab right now. Today we're going to talk about the first one, this transcription splicing connections. Uh, tightly related to the project on alternative splicing, where uh, we are actually going all the way from mechanistic inroads into how you actually alternatively splice messages, to visualizing those decisions by using fluorescence, to actually visualizing them in, in whole animals by using uh, luminescence in tumors and how tumors express genes differently, uh, to a very new project, which is probably more virtual than real yet, on, on flaviviruses, particularly yellow fever and dengue. And, and this is applying a lot of the technology that we've gotten from these two projects to these viral pathogens. Uh, but as I said, today we're going to talk about transcription splicing connections, uh, which is um, the, if you divide them into thirds, this is the bigger third of the lab. This is the second largest, and this is a, the baby third of the lab right now. Um, so. What I'll try to do is go through the different things. I will try to, as I said, we, we can't escape alternative splicing. It seems to be my obsession. But we're going to use that as a backdrop of knowledge to talk about the connections between transcription and splicing. And we're going to talk a little bit. I'm going to give you a little background on that so that we can speak a similar language. Uh, and for me to actually be able to frame it to you in the same way I try to frame it to myself. Then we're going to talk about. Um, how this work led us to physical and functional connections between the process of making RNAs and the process of processing them or splicing them. And then that will be, that's the tale of two students, a student that discovered an important connection from a protein we call CA150, and then a, and he's now a fellow at University of Wisconsin. He left the lab already, but the importance of what he did for a thesis was not apparent to me at the time, nor to him, nor to the field, and it's now become apparent. And he's a fellow, so he's going to get probably his most important paper some years after he left. And a student that's in the lab who's developing an in vitro system that um, will lead us to ask, I think, the important and answer, hopefully, answer the important questions. So, uh, introns. Um, redefined the way we think about genes back in the 70s. Uh, both works from several people at Cold Spring Harbor, mainly Rich Roberts and, and Phil Sharp and his colleagues at MIT, and Rich, and I've shown this slide here before, phrased it much more eloquently when he said that, when he said that these amazing sequence arrangements um, and were truly revolutionary back then. These divisions in the middle of genes were not expected from thinking about prokaryotes. So just the fact that there were introns there revolutionized our view of the genes. Um, very soon thereafter, I think we learned that it was only not one or two interruptions in the genes, but that actually 
genes as we define them, and this is mostly I'm going to refer to protein coding genes, because there are many other genes, for example, genes that are going for very small microRNAs that are different. But genes, when I say genes now, I'm going to be referring to maybe the 25, 30,000 genes that encode for proteins. And the majority of those are more intron than exon. And what are the introns? The introns are these interruptions that are actually transcribed. They're copied from the DNA. They're made into RNA. They're made out of that primary transcript. And this is, the, this is the type of diagram that I told you was wrong, so I'm showing it to you anyway. These primary transcripts are full of these introns, and these introns, as you can see from the numbers, are much larger than the exons. The exons are the parts that remain and go to the cytoplasm and get translated. So in general, 90% of the mass of a primary transcript gets destroyed or metabolized in some way. And it's only the very small, only about 10% or so comes out into the cytoplasm and gets translated into protein. I am not going to go into any of the detail of the machinery that actually defines these junctions and splices them together. So you can think of that as a black box in the background, and, and I'm going to talk about things that impinge on that um, without going into the details of the biochemistry and the chemistry of this. There's been beautiful work done on this, but today we don't have time to go through this. But just as the discovery that introns were there, that there are many in every gene, another discovery in the early 80s that really altered the way we think about the genome, and particularly the way about, that we think about you know, dogma, old dogmas in molecular biology like Francis Crick's one gene, one polypeptide chain, the, the, the surprise was the ability for things to do alternative splicing, for genes to undergo, or gene products to undergo alternative splicing. The, the bottom line is, one gene can encode usually one primary transcript that then can be processed to give you many, many different messenger RNAs. And it can be in the order of hundreds or even thousands different messenger RNAs, which have the capacity to encode hundreds or thousands of different proteins. So from one gene, you can have multiple proteins. And even the genetics can get complex, and I'll show you examples of this where mutations in one particular region of the gene give you a completely different phenotype from mutations in a different part of the gene. But and I, I don't want to belabor the different examples, but alternative splicing can occur in many different ways. Um, perhaps the most common way is one of these two right here, where you have what we call cassette-type exons. For example, in the cell or the state of the cell up here, this primary transcript includes this box here called M as an exon. This exon gets incorporated, it becomes part of the messenger RNA, and if this is in the coding region, that will change the coding uh, capacity of that messenger. Uh, in this other cell or different state or different moment or response to a hormone, it could be, you now switch this and you now ignore this exon and you put these two exons together and you now change the coding of this messenger RNA. You can also think that you not only can change the coding, you can also change the stability, you can change the location where the mRNA goes. So alternative splicing can itself give you many, many different outcomes from one gene. And you know, when, when the Genome Project came out and we realized how few genes we actually have, well, some people thought it was few genes, there was this um, sort of almost Freudian uh, gene copy number envy that occurred between, you know, <laughs> darn flies have almost as many genes as we have. And so, well, very few organisms can alternatively splice as much as mammals do, although it is actually a very ancient mechanism. Uh, in mammals, this is rampant. The best estimates right now for humans is that probably more than 75 percent of our primary transcripts are alternatively spliced. So, this is not a rare phenomenon. This is actually quite a common phenomenon. Perhaps one of the most interesting ones that have been recently developing, and which I actually, to be full disclaimer here, I actually have some biotechnological interest in, uh, in, in other words, I can make money out of this, so I have to tell you, uh, is the, the possibility that you could actually alternatively splice by transplicing two different messenger RNAs. And in Drosophila, this has now become uh, a, a well-established way of making proteins, so that actually proteins are encoded from two different chromosomes. And the two messages, pre-messengers, get together by transplicing exons from one 
and from the other, and the actual protein is encoded by two very different places in the genome. So all of these things give tremendous plasticity to the genome. And one of the things that we become very interested in, how do you regulate it? Because it's clear that although you can have all this assortment of different proteins, some of these cases are very, very highly regulated. So we decided to focus on one very specific example of alternative splicing. Um, this is the one that we study the most in the lab. I will use this to springboard and talk about regulation. And the reason we chose this example was because it is, it appears to be very specific in different types of tissues. So in, in this is a, one of the four fibroblast growth factor receptors. These are a, a gene family that encodes for growth factor receptors. Uh, these receptors mediate growth, also regulation of organogenesis. Um, and these uh, growth factor receptors, three of them, including this FGFR2, lead to two different receptors based on alternative splicing. If you do a very, uh, very superficial view of what the protein looks like, the extracellular domain, the part that interacts with the ligand, with the fibroblast growth factors, or FGFs, have three immunoglobulin-like domains. The third immunoglobulin-like domain comes in two flavors, and those two flavors are, are distinct in the C-terminal half of the domain. This part of the domain here that's in lighter blue can come in two different forms. At first, when it was cloned, people thought they were two different genes. But what actually happens is that some cells take this exon here and some cells take this exon here. And these two exons, exon 3B or 3C, for the two different forms of the second half of the IG3 domain, give you two different receptors, okay? And the main point I want to make here is that in epithelial cells in our bodies, you almost exclusively use this exon. So you splice from exon 7 to exon 8, you skip this one, and you splice to exon 10. So the protein encoded has this information, it doesn't have this one. In fibroblasts and other cells in the stroma, in the mesenchyme, you go from exon 7, you skip this one, and you go to exon 9 and to exon 10. And this is very highly regulated. Is it important? The answer is biochemically, yes. The receptors, this is work from Stu Aronson's group, the receptors bind different ligands depending on which exon you're using to encode. And the difference between the two forms of the receptor, they can distinguish about 10,000 fold, with a 10,000 fold discrimination between the two ligands. So essentially that means physiologically they, they don't bind the one that they do not bind at all in, in, our, in our bodies or in the mouse body. So biochemically, yes, the ligand binding residue, the, the residues that make contact with the ligand are encoded by that alternatively spliced exon for the most part. Biologically, it is important. Genetics in mice have shown that mutations in one exon give you um, defects in that particular tissue. In this mouse where there is an insertion in the 3B, this is work of Clive Dixon, you actually lose epithelium. Here's the skin of a normal animal. Here's skin, or what could be construed as skin, one layer of cells, immature epithelium in a mouse that's mutated only in that exon. These mice actually don't survive past birth. They have normal bones. On the other hand, this is an, ex an unfortunate experiment of nature. This is a case of Apert's syndrome. And the same thing happens in mice that have mutations in the other exon, exon 9 or 3C. You actually have bony malformations. You have very few problems with epithelium. Um, and in cases where you actually have misregulation, on top of a mutation in exon 8 and 9, you also have misregulation of exon 8. You get worse disease. So there is some suggestion that not only the right choice is important in different tissues, but making the wrong choice is also important. Um, so there's plenty of biological evidence that doing this is critical. Finally, the last example of relevance of why this is important I'm going to give you is an example that we also use to develop our experimental system, the cells that we grow in the lab and the, and the actual tumors that we study in the lab. And this is during the progression of prostate cancer. One of the things that happens in many cancers in prostate, it doesn't always happen, but it happens many, many times, is that these tumors, as they progress in humans and in animals, become more aggressive, 
And if you actually, for example, you implant tumors in animals and you and androgen the pry by castrating the animals, the tumors go away, but then they come back. And when they come back, they tend to be not only more aggressive, but they actually are androgen independent. They can grow in females as well as in castrated males. And one of the most dramatic things that is seen is that the receptor that is expressed is, is the opposite. So whereas the receptor expressed in the early tumors is the epithelial version of the receptor, which you would expect given that these are carcinomas, they are epithelial in origin. The, t the uh, receptor that is expressed later when the tumors are androgen independent is now the mesenchymal, and actually the mesenchymal type, and this goes hand in hand with a whole program of gene expression that makes these cells look a little bit more like fibroblasts. Let me just tell you, very, I don't have time to go over this project in the lab, but very recent data that we have in the lab suggests that this is not a permanent effect, but it's rather something that's, it's one of the things that has been classified in the general rubric of epithelial mesenchymal transitions, where these cells actually can toggle between one state and the other. And this is supposed to be extremely important in not only metastatic behavior of tumors, but actually once the tumors metastasize, to be able to switch back to an epithelial type uh, uh, phenotype and grow better a, as tumors. So this, um, I'm not suggesting that this is cause and effect. I'm suggesting that this, this is a good system to study this and maybe an interesting marker for prostate development. So we actually use prostate cancer cells for many of our experiments or human cancer cells. And you can see here, this is just to show you how tight the regulation of this alternative splicing is. This is, these are cells from, from early tumors in the rat. This is a syngenetic tumor that gets taken out and can grow in culture. And 100% of the, of the events that we see by RT-PCR or RNase protection or RNA invader assay uh, are all in the 3B form as expected of the epithelial type of splicing. And 100% of the events from the more advanced tumors are the other type. So this is just to show you that this seems to be 100% one way or the other. Uh, so it's a tightly regulated system and we use these uh, cancer cells as a good tissue culture model for this. I, I will not talk at all about the work that we do in actual tumors in animals, but we've been able now to visualize these decisions in tumors. Um, we can use this system then to say what is important to make this decision. How can we actually say what parts of these RNAs are critical to actually give us a decision in one cell or the other? And there what we do is, you know, what is despectfully called rack and check analysis or mutational analysis. You actually create a mini gene construct that you can artificially add to these cells by transfection. And then you ask, is the mini gene construct behaving like the endogenous gene? So we always compare what we add as mini genes. And these mini genes are driven by a different promoter. And you will see, as I'll tell you something in a moment, that we took an enormous risk in doing this. But what this slide shows is that there are many genes that are driven by the CMV promoter here and have, so essentially we've taken a, a piece of the gene from the rat here that includes these exon 3B and exon 3C, this five kilobases of the gene, we put it in between two heterologous exons, we express these RNAs in these cells, stable expression, and now these artificial constructs give us exactly or almost exactly the same result as the endogenous gene. In the DT3 epithelial-like cells, they give us 3B in here, and in the AT3 cells, they give us 3C. So we believe that this system can now lead us to study this. Um, so um, to make a long story short, I'm going to tell you work for something like three or four years of relatively dull work figuring out what every single cis-acting element within these RNAs that was necessary to do this. So, I think we've saturated bomb this 5 kb to where we know now what every single signal is doing in there. And I'm just going to give you a brief review and tell you some of the highlights so then we can talk about one particular event. So one of the things, so, so here again, the epithelial cells take the 3B, the mesenchymal-like cells take the 3C, and what's absolutely critical for this regulation is that the junctions, both 5' splice sites, which are shown here, and three prime splice sites, which are not shown in this slide, in order to get proper regulation, these motifs around the basic junctions between exons and introns have to be made a little weaker. 
They cannot be the strong consensus motif. That's pretty well characterized in many cases of alternative splicing. The second thing, and I'm not going to go through all the details here, is a whole series of cis-acting elements, which actually apparent, some of them act in both types of cells, but without them, you don't have regulation. So even though they don't have a, cells like, a cell type specific effect, if you don't have them, you don't set up regulation. And let, I mean, let me just focus on these in red, which are intronic splicer, splicing silencers. These elements silence the use of this exon. So obviously, these elements are dominant in mesenchymal cells, where you don't take this exon, you skip it. However, we know that a lot of their activity can be unmasked in epithelial cells. Okay? Nonetheless, um, in, in epithelial cells, they're counteracted by other elements. And those other elements are tissue-specific, epithelial-specific signals that recognize these other orange signals in here. And they eventually, all of these layers of regulation come together to give you 3C in mesenchymal cells, 3B in epithelial cells. So what we're going to be focusing on today is ver one very simple aspect of this regulation. So, uh, and it's a, the simple aspect of how do you silence exon 3B, okay? And that is mediated by a whole series of signals, and I will not tell you all the details of how we de determine them, but they're the signals that are mostly in red. There are silencers in the introns upstream, silencers here, and then one silencer in the middle, which is actually the work of Roger Brethnack in France. Um, and these elements together, particularly importantly, focus on the flanking, the two flanking, which we believe are the most important, keep this exon quiet in mesenchymal cells. So you don't see it. When you make the transcript, it gets spliced out. It gets ignored. Okay? Even if you don't have the choice to go to 3C, it will get ignored. Okay? Now, in epithelial cells, the exon will also be ignored if we don't have activating elements. So we know that the actual repressive forces are there, they're just being counteracted. But for the purposes of the rest of the talk, all you need to know is that these signals are very strong repressors of this exon. Okay? And, and I think the next slide shows the phylogenetic conservation. These things have been conserved through vertebrates. They're actually conserved in some degree, these silencers, which are here, and here, conserved in human, mouse, rat, chicken, they're actually conserved in centipus, and they're slightly conserved in sea urchin. We've cloned them all, we actually spent some time in the marine biological lab having a great time and doing phylogeny, and these things are highly conserved. And the exons are actually regulated similarly in these species. Um, we've only formally proven that all the way to chicken, but from biological observations, we believe it's the same thing in sea urchin. Um, this is just a functional assay, uh, just showing that if we delete one, the other, or both of these silencers, and in, again, this is, these are constructs that do not have activating elements, so all you're going to see here is repression of the exon, okay? And in all of those cases, if we delete those elements, we get mostly inclusion of the exon. If the elements are there, we get mostly uh, repression of the exon, skipping, so you splice from U to D, you ignore it in here, excuse me. If you delete them, you now include 3B almost 100% of the time. If you, instead of deleting them, replace them with all the sequences, you get the same effect. So that was the formal proof, and this was actually published uh, a few years ago, so I don't want to belabor it, but this was a formal proof that these things actually were silencing exon 3B. And now I'm going to tell you, again, I'm going to summarize two years of work into two slides, because I want to move on to what does transcription have to do with all of this? So, we proved that silencing of exon 3B is mediated by weak splice sites, an exonic splicing silencer, this is, as I said, work of others, and the flanking intronic splicing silencers. We actually identified um, factors that mediate this. We actually use RNA interference to prove that the, py the pyrimidine tract binding protein, or PTB, binds in here, and is actually essential uh, for this to happen. We also showed that this is not just specific for these genes, but that there are a whole family of other genes that have the same properties. And actually, one of the things that we're doing right now is taking this in an, a, a genomic-wide approach to look at every exon that's regulated this way. 
by PTB, by doing knockdowns and complementation of PTB and then doing uh, chips that actually measure exon inclusion. Um, we published a lot of this data. Some of it is being submitted right now, more, more of the details. We now have a new candidate for another protein called muscle-blind, and muscle-blind seems to be another protein, very interesting protein, actually, that may be the other partner that we had as a question mark for many years. This is still not proven. I just let you know I'm pretty convinced that's correct. Um, we don't know yet what mediates some of the, so everything up here, but we know that these things are, are actually involved in doing it. But then that was all pretty conventional, uh, pretty straightforward. We were happy. We felt comfortable. And then there were a couple of things that made us take pause and wonder about our results and those of others. And um, following up on Chris Smith, who is someone I admire very much in the field in alternative splicing, we decided to ask, what if we actually make the polymerase stutter a little bit or pause or s get stuck during the time that it's making these things? Uh, what would happen? And um, the reason we actually decided to do this was because there was a, a clear conviction by many of us that a lot of splicing and at least the marking of these RNAs as they were coming out of the polymerase was happening very, very quickly. And actually, there's very recent data from Luce's lab that says that splicing factors may bind these transcripts within seconds of them, of them being made. Um, and here is work from Ann Bayer, which is very pretty in, in Drosophila using uh, Miller spreads where she could actually almost visualize that the RNAs are actually, that introns are getting removed while these RNAs are still connected to the chromatin by the polymerase. So that, that means, if you believe these things, and I do, that as the polymerase is moving, part of the RNA is already being spliced. As beautiful as these images are, I think they're a little deceptive in what's really happening because I don't believe that the RNAs are actually hanging out. I believe that the polymerase is actually bundling these things together. And um, I've started a collaboration with Jack Griffith, who's a great electron microscopist at UNC, uh, where we're actually going to try to see these things in a much more native conformation, uh, especially from our in vitro system. But the bottom line is that this made us realize that splicing, not only splicing occurs co-transcriptionally, but it suggested to us that this must have important consequences in how you regulate alternative splicing. And Alberto Kornblith in Argentina has been one of the pioneers in actually showing that this is very likely to be the case, okay? So let me very quickly go through uh, one of the, the, the basic considerations, and this is just one of the many thought experiments that we, we've tried to do to actually see that even without any data, we should have figured out that transcription was going to play some important roles. So think about silencing of exon 3B, this is a schematic of exon 3B, as a static substrate, okay? Um, and this is, high, the next few slides are just fun speculation, and then we're going to get into some, some data. But you can imagine that if you add that to an extract, all those proteins that decide to silence the exon will jump right in and sit there and, and then mediate repression of the exon. That makes a certain amount of sense, and they would be in competition with whatever recognizes this. But neither the, the exon nor these would have a kinetic advantage. They would both be right there, already made, okay? Um, if, on the other hand, you have a mutation in the downstream silencer, and I showed you data before that said that if we mutated this guy, we actually inhibited silencing completely. So the bottom line is we know that this is what happens. Um, we don't get... The, the proteins can bind, and we know it can bind here, but nothing binds in here uh, that mediates, and then you don't get silencing, and you will get the positive acting factors, the factors that define an exon, as Super get described in the model of exon definition. They sit around, they define this as an exon, it gets eventually taken in and spliced. Um, however, w if we actually start thinking of the silencing from the point of view of dynamic substrate, immediately there are some problems that we can't completely resolved, and that is, well, first, you're making the RNA, there's a polarity in which you make it. The first thing that appears is this silencer right here. 
I mean, there's already part of the RNA over here, but in the, around this exon is this, and then the three prime splice site at the beginning of this exon appears, mm -hmm. and then as the polymerase goes, the five prime splice site of this exon appears. And you can imagine that right here, if you take this as the splicing substrate, you're missing the downstream element. The, the machinery doesn't know, as far as I can tell, whether, what's going to come after it. Is it a mutated? silencer downstream or is it a wild type one? And at this point, the exon has, for a few seconds, probably a kinetic advantage in splicing. Then you make the silencer, and we know that if the silencer is wild type, you silence. So this already frames and limits what we can think of in terms of, are we going to get silencing or are we going to get definition of the exon? And every single experiment that we had done in vivo had to deal with this issue because these were RNAs we made in the cells. But every single time we had done experiments in vitro, we could not recapitulate this dynamic view of the substrate of splicing. So this was one of the things that bothered me for many years. I just didn't like this idea, the fact that, that we were not able to recapitulate. And this may actually have something to do with the fact that the field, the biochemistry of the field, has been stuck for many years now and that the actual regulation of alternative splicing in vitro is very poor. People are publishing 1.3-fold effects, when in vivo what you have is 100-fold one way or 100-fold the other, so almost infinite effect. So, and this doesn't take into account, I think Carlos will probably tell you, that, that some of these errors in this process get dealt with by dealing with something he studies, uh, nonsense-mediated decay. But nonetheless, if you actually look at the choice, it's, it's dramatic. And in vitro, nothing but dramatic. And I thought this had something to do with it. So we decided to see if in this system, transcription could make a difference. And I'm, again, I'm going to make, this has been published last year, so I'm going to make it very brief. Just to say that if we actually inserted pulsing sites, so here is the, the mini genes again. You have the choice of taking 3B, taking 3C. And this is going to be done in cells where repression of 3B dominates. Okay? So this is going to be done in cells that they're mesenchymal in nature, they repress 3B. And we're going to ask, what happens to repression of 3B if we actually put this pulsing site? The reason I'm focusing on this, I'm turning history on its head, because we actually asked from it unbiased. And what we found is that transcriptional pulsing and promoters did not make a single bit of difference in terms of the, of the choosing of 3C or activation of 3B. But as you will see, it does make a difference in terms of silencing 3B, okay? And so what we did, we pulled this, this mass sites, which had been discovered by several different groups, but one of the people uh, who has used them quite a bit and, and characterized them is, is Nick Proudfoot. And I want to make just a caveat that these mass sequences may not bind the so-called mass factor that was originally supposed to be binding there. We don't know what binds these sequences. We know what they do. They actually, in vitro, and in vivo promote pulsing of the polymerase. And if we put these sites but not other control sequences, or in, um, we actually found that we could change the pattern of splicing. And the next um, slide is somewhat complicated, so I just focus on a few of the things here. Here is a pattern that you normally get, which was mostly the inclusion of, of the exon 3C. Okay, because these are cells, as I told you, that take this exon. So the derepression of 3B is seen now as a double inclusion event, where you actually stop repressing 3B and you take it in also. And that is, is um, what is represented here uh, by the black bar. So you can see this is an, uh, the result of an RNA's protection. You see that we saw with a mass site located somewhere within the region of silencing in different regions within that, uh, in different places within that region, and upstream of that region, which was the most surprising result, we actually saw an increase in 3B uh, inclusion, whereas if we actually put the site downstream of the latest silencer, we actually did not see the effect. Um, we, we tried, we have not formally proven that this is not a, now introducing a new RNA binding protein, although we transfected RNAs and there we did not see the effect. So we believe that it has to be mediated by transcription. Um, but I, I show this results more, more as, a, as a teaser as a, uh, to, to start suggesting that transcription is affecting this particular process of silencing. So the mass insertions 
phi prime of the upstream silencing elements or between them led to decreased in silencing. It, it completely deregulated something that had before been absolutely uh, uh, strong. Uh, as I said, transfections of RNA did not give this result. Actually, you got silencing of 3B. Uh, and additionally, changing the promoter altered both the splicing and the mass effect. So there, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. By no means is this proof that transcription is actually affecting uh, silencing. And the model, which we have not proven, which we're working on right now, is that the elongation complex of the polymerase is, is altered so that somehow that altered elongation complex is incapable of promoting silencing. Okay? Very diffuse idea. So this is what led us to the two questions that I'm going to try to answer today. And the first question is, okay, this is one example that I've given you here of splicing effects, I mean, uh, transcription effects changing splicing. There are, Alberto Kornblith has some very good ones. Other people in the field have now, uh, Bentley in Colorado has some good ones, but what mediates this things? What is it that's mediating the physical connection between transcription and splicing? And I'm gonna give you a partial answer to this question. And it comes, it starts with the work of a postdoc in the lab who discovered a protein we call CA150. It was originally identified as a transcription factor that uh, affected HIV TAT activation. It was purified uh, from TAT affinity columns. When overexpressed, it repressed the transcription of some promoters. Now we've done all the genomics. We know what genes are, are upregulated or downregulated by this protein. It's uh, only about 5% of the transcriptome is affected. The repression depends on the TATA box. So this transcription is changing a promoter's um, activity based on the TATA box, the specific TATA box that the promoter used, but it is affecting it by changing elongation efficiency. These sort of effects have now been seen. For example, the HIV TAT protein acts only on some TATA boxes, but it affects not initiation, it affects the properties of what has been initiated, how well they elongate. Um, so this protein um, was is quite large and is full of repeats of sequence motifs that we actually could identify. Uh, let me focus on three WW domains. We'll talk a little bit more about them. And then it was a founding member of domains called the FF domains uh, because of two conserved phenylalanines. The protein is highly conserved through evolution. And um, when we started investigating what it did from a more biochemical pr perspective, um, we found some interesting surprises. So here's the first tale of two students, and this is a student, Aaron Goldstrom, who's now with Marv Wickens at Wisconsin. Uh, and Aaron was probably the most intellectual student I've ever had. He knew the literature better than I did by far. He put twice as, uh, two, two papers on my desk for every paper I put on his, uh, and was just fantastic. Um, he, he was not a bench monster in the sense that he took forever to do experiments sometimes because he was a perfectionist. But, and as I said, it has been only with time that we've realized that he made probably what was an interesting connection. So remember, at this time we thought this was an elongation factor. It affected polymerase elongation very clearly in, in vitro and in vivo. Okay? And when Aaron actually did immuno, co-immunoprecipitations with and very good antibodies that we made in the lab against C150, made by Carlos Sunya, who was a great immunologist, uh, he saw that, yes, it brought down very well-known elongation factors like TADSF1, like cycling T1 and CDK9, components of the PTFB elongation factor. And it did not bring down a whole series of other factors, um, some of them even very sticky ones like TF2, uh, like TBP, which binds everything under the sun if you don't do things right. And then, not surprisingly, it brought down RNA polymerase too. However, Aaron was very careful to note that it preferentially brought down something called 2-0, okay? It's a form of RNA polymerase too. So it brought down both forms, 2A and 2-0, but if you see what was in the original and the supernatant of this extract, it was mostly 2A. I can tell you that this preps did not have enzymatic activities that changed 2A to 2-0. Okay, we tested all that. It actually really brought down 2-0 preferentially. So it took the little bit of 2-0 that was barely visible in the extract, and it was highly uh, enriched in the, in the pellets. Um, so what is 2-0, and why were we interested? Well, we were excited about it because it, 
you know, confirm what we thought. Although, we, you know, you'll see that we had better reasons to be excited. And that what, what 2 0 is, is a form of polymerase that's associated with elongation. It is a form of polymerase where the C terminal tail or the C terminal domain of RNA polymerase 2 is hyperphosphorylated. And that essentially is only seen during elongation of transcription. Making sense because we thought this was an elongation factor, so it was at the right time at the right place. Um, okay. But it went a little further than that. We were very lucky to have Arno Greenleaf at Duke, who actually discovered the C terminal domain of polymerase, so we did some more experiment. Aaron and people in his lab did more. So Aaron and people in Arno's lab discovered that the FF repeats of this protein were absolutely necessary to bind the polymerase. So they were necessary because when we deleted them, they didn't bind polymerase. Here is a, this piece did not bind polymerase, whereas this piece here bound polymerase and immunoprecipitated it, both in vitro and in co-expression and co-immunoprecipitations, which are pseudo in vivo because they're really extracts that then you immunoprecipitate. But they're taken somewhat loosely as suggesting that this happens in vivo. It happened both with antibodies to the CA150 and with antibodies to a tag that we put on the CA150. So it looked very specific. Um, and again, as I said, in, in vitro, we could reproduce the same experiments. Uh, in collaboration with Sherry Cardi, uh, our, uh, Aaron showed that you could actually bind directly the FF domains to the fossil CTD, but not to the non-phosphorylated CTD. And now with very nice peptides that have the same charge, but are not made, are not phosphorylated the way the CTD is, and I don't have time to get into all the details of the CTD, but we've shown that it's not just a matter of charge preference for these things. So these, these proteins really like, this FF domains like to bind the CTD. Great. That made a lot of sense for an elongation factor. And then Aaron really made a surprising discovery. He said, okay, well, we've been so successful looking at the C terminal half of the protein. Why don't we see what the N terminal half of the protein is doing? So he started saying, smartly you know, if he guessed that the WW domains, well, actually, this is a matter of practicality, this QA domain is 72 amino acid repeat of QA, QA, QA. It is a bear to work with. It's almost impossible to get proteins to be synthesized doing this. And the polyproline domain was like a stone also. So we, you know, essentially he did what he could, although he tried to get, make deletions and, and make proteins of each. But he focused on these WW domains because they actually, they're also like little stones, but they form beautifully folded domains. They actually behave very, very well. They're very easy to crystallize and, and, and get NMR structures. Actually, this is one of the, the CA150 uh, uh, W domain work of others, not work of ours, but they determine this structure. These are protein-protein interaction domains, very common in nature, and they're involved in all kinds of different effect, uh, different events. And he asked, do, what are the WW domains of CA150? What are they binding? What are they interacting with? Um, the first thing he did, and, and, and Carlos Sunya did the same, uh, is show that at least some of the transcriptional effects of CA150 depended on these domains too. So this is one year of work and one slide. I apologize to Aaron for doing this, but he essentially what he did, using mutants and affinity columns, he purified what bound to this WW domains. And he found that this protein of 80 kilodaltons, which was one of the major species that bound, was the splicing factor SF1. I, I was actually in Logan Airport when Aaron got this information. He called me up, and my first reaction was very negative. I said, oh, damn it. You know, SF1 is probably binding everything. You know, and Aaron said, well, we th you know, I'm not so disappointed. I said, nah, I got on the plane, and, you know, I got philosophical at 20,000 feet. And then all of a sudden I said, wait a minute. This could be really interesting. Um, and it, I think it was. So... That was the first hint we had that this may actually be binding both the RNA polymerase II with one end of the protein and splicing factors with the other. So we decided to put this idea to the test, and we actually asked what mediates, you know, to answer the question, well, maybe it's CA150. Maybe this is one. I, we don't think this is the only bridge by any means. We think this may be one of the first bridges where there's actually been physical proof that it binds on both sides. There's a few predictions. Obviously, I put here the ones where we've answered. There are many other predictions we have not yet answered, okay? Um, we are now doing, obviously, we can knock this protein down very easily using RNAi. We can complement the knockdown. We're doing the experiments to ask what splicing changes. Those are ongoing. Seems interesting, but I'm not 100% convinced yet that we've identified the targets that 
where splicing is changed. But if it binds, if it's truly doing this, maybe it is actually binding other splices on components. Maybe it should co-localize the splicing factors, and maybe there should be some functional consequences in assays that measure splicing. And um, as I said, you know, obviously one biases one's talk to what's his, what has worked, and the bottom line is, yes, Aaron had actually done this experiment before I did the, he hadn't shown me this, but he had actually immunoprecipitated C150, and as one of the controls, he said, he checked for many other splicing factors. Okay, and it actually, C150 immunoprecipitated very specifically, I'm only showing you some of the controls. This is an anti-GST serum, I'm sorry, these are, these are antigen affinity purified antibodies from the same serum, because this rabbit was immunized against GST C150 fusion. And then from the same serum, he got the GST antibodies and the anti C150 antibodies. And we've done many other controls and multiple different rabbits, and this, can, this is reproducible. It's actually been reproduced now by Alberto Kornblith, also in Argentina, that you can bring down SM proteins with this. You can also bring down U2A F65, which is the partner of SF1 in binding the three prime end of intron. So again, and this was done also both from extracts and also from overexpression in cells and co-immunoprecipitation. And then in collaboration with Carles Sunye in Madrid, we've done some scanning um, confocal, and I don't know if we can have the lights down a little bit. These are a little pixelated, I apologize, but this is relatively new data that Carles just sent me over the airwaves. And it looks like there's very nice co-localization uh, although these are very abundant proteins, so they're everywhere in the nucleus, but you can actually do some more sophisticated um, um, uh, uh, confocal, and it, it actually looks at t is as the Hugo name for CA150. I apologize. Carlos is trying to make, modernize me and make me use the Hugo name. So this is CA150. It co-localizes with the SM proteins. Um, it also co-localizes with SE35 and with U2AF65, and we're now proceeding on to do FRET microscopy to actually ask whether they're actually close together in the nucleus. And that is, should be in the next month or so, we should, we should have that done. So that was, that was encouraging. And then finally, um, I tend to be driven by function, so we actually ask, if you overexpress CA150 or if you knock it down, what happens? And I only have the first half of that story uh, finalized, and that is, we did some of the overexpression experiments and then overexpressed a couple of mutants. And I want you to, again, because it's a complex slide, this is the wild type CA150 overexpressed, and then a mutant where you have actually done triple amino acid changes, well, critical three amino acids in WW domains, W1 and 2. And, and then there's another mutant where we've deleted the fifth FF domain, and then there's half of the proteins. And the bottom line is that only when you have both um, either W, well, let me, let me rephrase that. The wild type, you know, this is the effect of the wild type. Let me start with that and tell you that here is that mini gene I talked about before. This is a cell line that preferentially takes 3C. So this is what you have in the cell line. You mostly have 3C. You have some double inclusion in this cell line. This is a, a 293T cell. Um, you have this double inclusion in the endogenous gene gets completely taken care of by nonsense mediated decay. You don't see that from the endogenous gene, but our mini genes don't have an open reading frame, so we see all the splicing events, actually, or we think we do. We said get the same pattern from nuclear or cytoplasmic RNA. And then very little of this RNA gets skipped and ignores both of the exons and goes around completely. But if you overexpress CA150, you dramatically increase that at the expense of taking 3C. So overexpression of 3 50 inhibits this, and there's, we, we have other splicing constructs where you actually see absolutely no, no change with CA150. And in order to have this effect, you need to have either WW1 or 2, because when you mutate both, you abrogate it, and you clearly have to have an intact um, FF uh, region. And these proteins are all expressed at the same level. What I cannot guarantee you is that one of them hasn't become a noodle and it's like totally denatured. So that is harder to do. Um, but we believe that very likely it suggests that you need both ends of the protein to actually get this functional effect. We are pursuing this now by looking at several things. Let me tell you one negative result we had, which is when we, we tried looking at the endogenous gene. We always try to do this when we have an effect like this. And in the endogenous gene, we had a hard time seeing this, but we have in the past have to create TET-inducible frit lines to actually, where there's 
very good induction of the of a gene that you to actually see effects on endogenous genes. But nonetheless, it's, it's a negative result. Um, but this is suggestive that C150 may affect um, splicing outcomes. Now, to give due credit to others, um, uh, Jung Wei Tarn in Taiwan and Alberto Kornblith, actually in collaboration with us, have both seen similar effects of both overexpressing, Tarn only in overexpression. With, with Alberto, we've actually knocked down CA150 and seen changes in the fibronectin 3B exon, E3B exon, which is unrelated to 3B. So there's a couple of other examples now where we've seen these. Um, so the conclusions from this tale of one student, CA150 binds the phosphorylated form of RNA polymerase 2, it needs the FF domains, and also it interacts with other elongation factors, probably via the same domains. It binds the SF1 and at least the SF1 and SM proteins, and both of those require WW. I didn't show you all of that data. It colocalizes with splicing factors. And other groups have shown in proteomic analysis that both CA150 and SF1, not surprisingly for SF1, are present in purified splicesomes. So this in interaction with SM and other splicesome components has been confirmed by proteomics. Um, Overexpression of CA150 leads to skipping of exon 3C into 93 T cells and requires either one of these two WW domains and an intact set of FF domains. We are now establishing precisely how many FF domains we need and which ones we need. They're, they don't, may all not be equivalent to do that. But this represents the first case in which a protein has been truly shown to, to both have functional activity but also physically touch both machineries at once. Still haven't proven that it does it. It's, it's a, early chapter and we're going to try to prove that it does this. So this is the model, CA150 is binding this intron, it's also binding elongation factors, also binding the polymerase and affecting probably both transcription and splicing because actually this is probably a two-way street of influence. It's not just transcription affecting splicing but introns affect transcription and there's good data for that also from other groups that the polymerase knows whether it's transcribing one of these huge genes that has introns. I don't know what I'm doing time-wise, but I have just a few more minutes to tell you about the other short tale of another student. Um, and this is uh, Barbara Natalicio, who's a student in the lab. She's incredibly talented. Um, and essentially what she's trying to ask is, can we develop systems or how can we study the mechanism by which things get coupled? Now, let me tell you what the problems are here <laughs> as a disclaimer. We all know that we can splice beautifully in vitro without having transcription. We can make an RNA by T7 bacteriophage polymerase, purify it, dump it into a helonuclear extract, and we get splicing. Pretty simple constructs, usually. Complex things, if it has more than one intron, then you're talking more time, and it's very inefficient, and you get beautiful gels because people only show you the RT-PCR or the band that is the splice product. They don't tell you that that's 0.1% of the RNA they put in there, um, or the RNA that remain after degradation. Uh, and we, we've all done this. I mean, you do what you can, and these things work. And you actually get good data from these experiments. You, some great things have been determined, have been confirmed biologically, even other organisms that were genetics or were more tractable. But, so that's a problem, because you can get splicing without transcription. You can also get transcription without splicing. We know that you can get in vitro transcription. So, what we're studying here is something that changes the efficiency of splicing, okay? And therefore, we were worried about, are we going to see this effect? But we believe that most of these systems are innately inefficient in extracts and that if we can get to higher efficiencies and get it closer to in vivo, we then should be able to do, um, to truly study what mediates this, maybe test biochemically the CA150 idea of that it is a coupler. So we decided to start, start humble. Barb is, in, even though I, I tend to be nonlinear, Barb tends to be very, very linear. She actually wants to go one step at a time, and she's very determined to do this. So she started with beta globin, which is a wimpy gene. It's complex for in vitro systems, but in terms of genes, this is like a pygmy for protein coding genes. It has only three exons. It's really small in terms of the, all the nucleotide levels. And yet, if you, you know, if you put an RNA made by T7 in this, as you will see in a moment, actually you'll see an extreme example of this, if you actually pre-synthesize, you make an RNA in vitro using bacteriophage, you put it in a, in a splicing extract, you get um, 
some splicing of, of each of the exons to each other, but very inefficient splicing of these two exons, and almost none splicing of all three. Um, so we decided to use this. It has all of the correct sequences and regulatory signals, including polyadenylation signal, et cetera, for the human beta globin uh, pre-mRNA. It is driven by the CMB promoter because the globin promoter is, is somewhat difficult to work in vitro. Uh, the total length of the transcript is 1,600 nucleotides, and as I said, complaint contains all of the bells and whistles of beta globin. Um, the expected result is that if you make an RNA using a CMV promoter and you incubate this, um, excuse me, if you, if you make this plasmid and you make a linear fragment or a circular fragment with uh, a plasmid, you put it in an extract. If the extract is capable of transcribing, you should make a transcript that should be recognized as a pre-mRNA and you should get splicing and polyadenylation. And at least, I'm not going to talk about polyadenylation, we have very recent data that it is happening. Actually, Barb discovered a cryptic polyacite, which actually we now go back and think it's used in vivo, but we have to confirm that. But it is, that's, that's occurring. Um, you expect an unspliced RNA, if, if it ever gets made, and we do see some of it being made, uh, we expect you can get exon one with two, or two with three, and then one, two, three. Um, we also have transcript uh, plasmids where instead of having the immediate early CMV promoter, we have a T7 promoter here. And we actually spike HeLa nuclear extract with T7 RNA polymerase so that you can actually get T7 RNA polymerase to synthesize in the extract, okay? Uh, and there's also the conventional splicing reactions, which I, where you actually pre-synthesize the RNAs. We do this either with polymerase Two, we can do this with polymerase two and isolate it, prevent splicing from happening, isolate those RNAs, or make them from T7, and then put them in the extract. So we're going to compare a few things, and I'm only going to show you a couple of slides. So the assay that Barb developed is a reverse RNAs protection, for reasons that if you want to know why, I'll tell you later. There were some complications of doing a direct RNAs protection, um, where you actually label the RNA with label in during the incubation, and then you protect with a cold probe. And going from bottom to top, you get the, if the, it's on splice, you will get X on one. And this will be the same as if you get, you know, two and three splice, you can get this on splice X on one will give you this size. And it actually gives a doublet because of a nucleotide difference at, right at the, at, the, at the site. You get X on three, you can see it here. X on two is up here. And then the splice products, two and three, we almost never see uh, by itself. One and two splice together, and then one, two, and three give a band up here. And um, this is a, the one experiment I'm going to show you um, where Barb did a time course of a template that uses the endogenous RNA polymerase or a template that uses C7 RNA polymerase. And you can see that the difference is dramatic. We don't understand the difference completely. But what we know is this is much better not only than this, it's much better than pre-synthesized RNA. So it's still slow. So we're still not happy with this, but it's a lot better than you get with T7 RNA polymerase. Uh, and it's not an inhibitory effect of T7 RNA polymerase. We've already determined that. So, and this is, this is the band that we're most interested in. This is the one, two, three splicing. Now, this is a little bit overexposed, but what you can see is splicing is occurring while transcription is still occurring, it doesn't mean from this experiment that it's occurring in templates that are bound to the DNA yet. So that those are, although we, we have some evidence that that's the case, the efficiency tells us that it's very likely occurring co-transcriptionally. And that means that the polymerase is still engaged in the DNA while this reaction is ongoing, or that the polymerase has marked the RNA in some ways that it doesn't do if you synthesize it with something else. Um, we're actually doing some tricks by putting the C-terminal domain on T7 polymerase and asking to do that. We tried to do that in vivo with Paul 3 and it was beautiful experiments that gave us some biggest results, but I uh, won't go into those, um, to ask whether the CDD may be sufficient to give you this kind of effect. So let me summarize this. Uh, Barb has success, I say Barb has successfully developed, and we had published a previous embodiment of this, but nowhere as, as efficient as this optimize the system for doing in vitro what we call couple because it changes the efficiency, but we haven't proven that formally. 
that is capable of splicing transcripts of modest complexity. Obviously, we're now trying slightly more complexity, going to uh, alternative splicing substrates now and seeing if we can get bigger differences. Uh, and we're also complete, there's a, there's a stu new student in the lab just changing the way the extracts are being made. There were old reports about particular matter in the extracts where 99% of the activities, this is F. Stadviates and Maniates, and people had this reports that that's where most of the splicing activity occur in these surfaces. When you look at nuclear extracts, it's a mess. So we're trying to see whether we can actually get better efficiencies that way. Because as I said, this is a slow process. I don't think this is anywhere as fast as it should be. Um, we have shown this co-transcriptional splicing. It occurs during transcription, and, and we have some evidence that you can we had it before, and we have some evidence now. You can pull down the templates, and the polymerase is still engaged, and the template still has the RNAs that are spliced on it. Um, and then, as I showed you, more efficiency. Uh, we have also evidence that suggests that three prime processing is occurring in the system. And finally, very new data that exon definition is operative. So when we make certain mutations in the middle exon that are not predicted by the conventional intron definition approach to affect the first intron, we actually see what you see in vivo, which is instead of that intron still splicing, you ignore the whole thing and you skip across, which is the basis of exon definition. And that um, is, is, we think, important, one of the important uh, definitions because it is very likely that exon definition is actually mediated co-transcriptionally. So the model of exon definition here that we have is that an exon that is silenced is an exon, and this is now rampant speculation based on thoughts and some of what I showed you, but that an exon that is in a cell line, for example, in mesenchyme where exon 3B is not taken in, we believe that the way you do not exon define, that you skip, is you remove the exon away from the polymerase. And that exon now is in a compartment where it's not actually visualized. It could also sterically hinder splicing factors, although the genetics, for example, in Drosophila and sex lethal do not agree with simple steric hindrance models. Um, so we believe that these things are put in some sort of zone that we call zone of silence, which is away from the polymerase, whereas an exon, in this case exon 3B in epithelium, is actually included. We believe that that exon is being recruited to the polymerase. And it's because it is near the polymerase, it is actually active. We also believe that this sort of recruitment of exons to the polymerase, which was in so, a very early idea embodiment of this was postulated by Arno Greenleaf in the early 90s. We believe that this also explains why we don't have rampant, rampant transplicing between pre-mRNAs, which are, if they would be floating out like in those Miller spreads, you would think that there would be rampant transplicing. And that, even though Tom Gingeras has some new data about some transplicing occurring, it's still very, very low levels. We believe the reason it doesn't transplice, given that the spliceosome doesn't have to scan through the intron, we proved that in the early 90s, uh, it is probably the polymerase that does the scanning and prevents one exon from meeting a partner in another part of the uh, chromosome. So this is a model that's going to take us a few years to prove, but I think both having CA150 as a potential bridge here uh, that we can actually do some real experiments with and now eventually developing a true regulated in vitro system will be able to answer these questions. So first, I wanted to give special thanks to the first person I did science with. And I, I can't be here today if it were not for George. So before the acknowledgments come the special thanks. Um, special thanks to all of you for coming, and also for inviting me to the department. And let me acknowledge the people who actually did the work. Um, Nicole Robson, James Pearson, and I have Nicole twice here with her Mary name and before, sorry. Uh, underlying names are people who contributed in some way to the work. But the people I really want to highlight are the two students, Barbara and Natalicia, who's done all of the in vitro transcription splicing system, uh, and Aaron Goldstrom, who's now a fellow at Wisconsin. Uh, they were both great students, and I think, uh, you know, I owe them a tremendous amount, and obviously I can't be here without these guys, uh, uh, which supported all of this work. So all of these projects are supported by the NIH and the NCI. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias por un seminario excelente y abrimos para preguntas. Por favor, utilicen el micrófono.
Um, thank you, Dr. Garcia Blanco. Um, I have a question for you. I remember a few years ago, you were very interested in nuclear compartment compartmentalization. Sorry if I get, I don't say it right. Um, <clears throat> do you still believe in that? Um, is the nuclear nucleus uh, compartmentalized, and is that how uh, the factors are brought together? Right. So actually, yes, yes, I do believe in that. And I think there's data from other labs have shown that there are s these territories that may even be common in different cells. Um, we've only published one paper on it. It was in developmental cell um, two years ago, I think, and, and it was more of the architecture of the nucleus. It was um, developing the system that I was hoping would be used, which is Clamidomonas, that would be used to actually study this. Fortunately, the guy who did this uh, moved on, and nobody in the lab has picked it up, so it's a project that's orphaned right now in the lab. But Bruce Solinger at Duke is also very interested in this and is actually using transplicing. So, you know, even though I said transplicing is not rampant, you can force it to happen. Well, we hope you can force it to happen because that's, you know, my biotech uh, needs would require that. But well, you can force it to happen. So Bruce is actually asking, if you put one of these transplicing traps, does it always hit the same transcripts preferentially, which would suggest an architecture to interface nuclei by having, you know, a common target very nearby. In other words, if you, if you, put, if you integrate this very close to actin, beta actin, you expect that just because their prim the primary sequence is closed, you may be able to, to transplice to the actin message very frequently. But do you also see other favored transcripts that may be nearby, not because they're in the primary, you know, they're not on the same chromosome, but because they have similar uh, population of factors that brings it to the same subcompartment of the nucleus. So we'll know if those experiments are successful, we'll know whether you can have some evidence for that. And I'll have questions for you later this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is in reference to your CA150 overexpression. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If the idea is that CA150 is acting as a bridge, I'm sorry, can you, yeah. why wouldn't disrupting one end or the other or one of the binding sites be sufficient to so, so for the function, for the um, either dis disruption of either the WWs or the FF destroyed the activity. Oh, in, in either case? In either way, yes. Okay, okay. Yes, it did. No, th there's some great questions about the overexpression of, you know, uh, we can never fully interpret the overexpression as saying that more of this is bad for splicing mm -hmm. because it could be that we're disrupting, you know, it may be that it's a modulator of inclusion, but that by overexpressing it, you destroy a complex or something. So I always caution. I, in a way, I thank you for the question for a different reason, which yeah. is I think one has to be very careful with overexpression experiments. But in this case, either mutation destroyed it, destroyed the activity. Complete to the same. It was. It looked to me like it was graded. That's it was well. That so, it was WW1 or two. So it seems that one WW1 or two are redundant. So those are in the same yeah. end. Okay, but they're bind. Right. Yes, yeah, they're binding. That they those apparently what happens there is either one of them can actually do whatever in terms of binding. And if you destroyed both of them, that almost gave you the same level of destruction as if you deleted FF5. Okay, and with the FF, was the yeah, same thing? With the, with the Delta FF, you got the same effect. It was one deletion of one FF5. You got the same, about the same effect as if you deleted both one and two of the WWs. So I, I, I see what you're saying. So yeah, it, it makes sense, and that's... Uh, In your in vitro experiment, when you try to um, do the in vitro um, splicing mm -hmm. and transcription mm -hmm. coupling, um, when you were presenting the T7 RNA polymerase and the RNA polymerase 2, I was expecting the results that, that, that you presented at the end, that the RNA polymerase was going to be more efficient than the T7. Is there a way like that you could immunodeplete, for example, the phosphorylated form of the RNA polymerase two, in your extract, and see what is the R right, or or in some way ask whether phosphorylation of the CTD yes. is required. So yes. the best way, that's it's a good idea. The depletion will be tough because what happens is there's a very low percentage. What happens is when you initiate, it then gets phosphorylated. So so it will be inhibiting PTFB, and John Liss published what is the most specific inhibitor uh, last year. So we're going to use this inhibitor. Uh, because, you know, before that, people were using some uh, pretty broad kinase inhibitors that did other things. And, and so this one looks pretty good, so we're going we're gonna to try it. So it's, I think it addresses a similar question. 
The other thing that we're, we're doing is we're constructing now a new HeLa cell that has an amanitin resistant version of, you, you know the system, it has an amanitin resistant pol 2 and, or an amanitin resistant pol 2 that has a truncated CTD or one that has no CTD at all. And then you do the, all the experiments only in the presence of amanitin. So you only see that polymerase acting and then you ask, is the CTD required? Those are, those are very good experiments that, that Barb needs to do. And she, well, she's, she's getting them set up, but the inhibitor is easy. The, genet, the creating the cell lines has been a little more difficult. Absolutely, no, 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 and I went over. No, and I went over. I didn't realize how far over. I, what time is it? Did I go way up? Oh my God, that's terrible. Oh, I, st I started ten minutes late, but still. Okay, that'd be great. Yes. No, I can understand that. Okay. Okay. Go so visit. Yes. I think she'll find Durham sort of intermediate in climate between Minnesota and San Juan. Yes. Yes. Yes.